sounds like lunchtime conversation was pretty fruitful. Um, I hope that everyone found somewhere to eat. And we've got a, another full afternoon of uh, hopefully really interesting presentations. Um, and um, I'd like to kick off first off by asking you to welcome to the stage Paul Barnett, who's the founder and acting CEO of the Strategic Management Forum, uh, who's talking about rethinking strategy and how organizations can thrive during the rapid change ahead. Paul. Oh, OK, thanks very much. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it now. Quick, one quick reminder, if you are on Twitter, its hashtag is anticipating2025. Okay, and just to check, can everybody hear me at the back? Okay, great. Um, well, I wanted to actually begin by sort of making some reference to the presentations we saw this morning, but I'm not quite sure. I've been racking my brains over lunch to see how we could actually relate strategy uh, to love and sex with robots. I gave up on that one. <laughs> Strategy doesn't get that interesting, unfortunately. Um, before I, just as a backdrop, before I go into the presentation, um, I did want to relate to one presentation this morning, um, and that was the Empowering Africa uh, presentation. Simon uh, basically uh, explained, and I, I think this is a quote, um, that it's not technology that actually is driving what uh, they're doing. It's actually a business model. So it's not, it's not new tech that they were promoting. It's a new business model. And I think that demonstrates uh, really what I'm going to go on to talk about. Because it's business models that get funded, not technology. Um, and basically, it's business models um, that strategic management is actually about, um, how to actually come up with them, how to um, implement them in practice. Um, so we'll certainly be touching on that. Um, but also, I think it's better business models um, that we need to be focusing on. And it's those that are really going to foster uh, the speed with which we can actually make progress and the speed with which technology then is going to be adopted. And several of the presentations this morning talked about the problem of funding, the speed with which um, ideas were being developed was being held up uh, by lack of funding, either for research or for implementation. So I think in that context, uh, I'll argue that strategic management's got a very strong role to play. Before I go on, I just want to check um, how many people in the audience think they know what strategy actually is? Okay, a fair few. I guess maybe people that have been on uh, uh, MBA programs perhaps. Um, so what I'm going to say is going to be maybe challenging for people that have done their MBA uh, several years ago and maybe less challenging for some people that have done their MBAs um, or studied business more recently. Um, so I'm going to begin. Uh, actually, if you ask a hundred strategists to define what strategy is, you'll probably get a hundred different answers. And I therefore actually deliberately narrow it down to what I'm calling strategic management, which I see as being a way of thinking um, planning and acting, and it, it actually is something that people do at all levels of the business, um, irrespective of whether they call themselves strategists or not, and irrespective really of their function. Obviously some people have a stronger strategic role uh, than others, but I would argue that strategy needs to be understood um, at many more levels than it currently is. And the purpose uh, of strategic management is to design and deliver optimal results um, for organizations. And I say organizations because I don't just mean business. And over the long term. Uh, so we're talking there about sustainability in the broadest sense. There's a big but. And that is that what many of us who went to business school several years ago learned, actually 
we need to unlearn some of the things we learned because actually we could find that it's pretty dangerous. Many people would recognize this man, perhaps. Can I just get an indication of how many people do know who this is? Okay. So he's Michael Porter, and basically his ideas have dominated uh, strategic thinking for, you could say, the last four decades. Um, he's the Harvard Business Review professor whose focus is really on competitive strategy. Um, and many of the strategy tools that people will be familiar with, even if they've not really studied strategy, um, are on this diagram. I'm not asking you to look at the tools, I'm just basically putting them there to show you that these three or four really well-known tools uh, came from this source. Uh, they're basically five forces that shape the competitive landscape for a business. Um, they're what he calls uh, generic strategies. Um, so he's basically suggesting that there are a few ways essentially to compete. Um, and then the value chain is a term that many people will be familiar with as well. Uh, more recently, uh, his ideas, um, which are basically a, a based on the idea that you aim to achieve a sustainable competitive advantage, are being challenged. Um, and this is uh, Rita McGrath, um, who we've had the pleasure of uh, speaking at a couple of our events recently. Um, and she's the author of this book. And it basically challenges the idea that in the current world that we live, um, it makes any sense at all to try to achieve sustainable uh, competitive advantage. Um, so I'm not going to read what's on the slide. I'll just let you read quickly. There's only one line on each one. And she, as you see in this quote, is basically really challenging the assumption that it's a worthwhile goal trying to achieve sustainable competitive advantage. Okay, the reason that it's not um, a, a goal that maybe is now worth fighting for, it's not because we shouldn't be looking for competitive advantage. Um, it's just that advantage is increasingly transient, and that's the word that she uses. I actually think the book would have been better titled Transient Advantage. And is the, the speed of change, so sh she basically suggests that we should be looking for uh, the next advantage all the time and ideally building uh, business models that provide us with a portfolio of advantages that are at different stages of development. But just going back to Michael Porter, um, there is still some merit, I'm not discounting Michael Porter for one minute, um, there's merit in, in his arguments but I'm sure he would be the first to actually recognise that things are moving on. The strategy that he and most of his contemporaries have been talking about for the last four decades are really about strategy of an industrial era when it was basically relatively stable um, competitive landscape. You know, not that long ago, uh, a Fortune 500 company could probably be relatively likely to expect to be in that category for 75 years. That figure is now 15 years. Uh, they'll fall out of the 500 and many will disappear altogether and we know plenty of casualties, Kodak, blah blah blah. So, but in, in that era the, uh, the, the, sorry, era, the idea was that you find your competitive space um, and, and then you build barriers uh, to defend it and at that time you could invest heavily. Uh, life cycles of products were longer um, and basically investing in a lot of physical assets was the way to build those uh, barriers to entry to prevent um, competitors coming in. 
standardizing processes, which often required lots of physical assets to achieve, um, was a way of bringing down cost. And, and basically, the focus was on efficient processes. Um, I mean, that's, I think, going to be familiar to you know, most people, even if you haven't studied business. But uh, these are some of the sort of strategy jargons that um, people would, uh, that have studied business would know and others may not. But all of these uh, are attempts to basically improve performance. Um, that then is really a sort of about bringing down costs, maximizing efficiency, sustaining the advantage for as long as possible. This diagram shows um, the typical life cycle um, of a business, and it's a diagram you'll find in nearly every uh, business textbook. Uh, but if you look at the actual shape of these curves, um, they're actually not that dissimilar whether you're talking about the life cycle of a company, a product, the life cycle of customers or technology. Um, and the tip, a business will typically go, go through these various different stages. To be honest, um, that's not changed that much, apart from the fact that the bottom line, which is time, uh, means that that cycle is just going faster and faster. So how do you uh, deal with a situation like that. I mean, if you want, if you if, if invested massively in assets, you probably won't get the time to actually get the return on assets that you necessarily need. So, Rita is basically, in contrast, um, arguing that we need to accept uh, rapid change and the fact that any advantage is going to be transient. We need to deal with short life cycles. Um, we need to deal with low barriers to entry, much uh, greater global competition, which again didn't really exist when Michael Porter was talking four decades ago. Um, and she talks about the idea that what business needs to be doing is basically focusing on surfing the waves of a, a transient advantage, um, being really aware of where the next advantages are likely to come from. So it's great to be able to sort of listen to futurists and get some perspective on that. Um, but it's really, where is the value um, in the technologies that are being developed? So again, I'm coming back to the business model because uh, Rita, I heard speak last week, said basically the thing to do is sort of, well, we're thinking much further out, but she said, as at least a starting point, think five years out and work out what your customers are going to be wanting in terms of value in five years' time and work back and work out what that means in terms of what you should be doing in the business today. Um, then you can actually start to bring about change, and she recommends embedding uh, innovation and not considering it to be just an exercise. The problem we've got is that actually most businesses still practice uh, strategy of the industrial age, still looking for competitive space, still looking to maximize uh, competitive advantage. Um, and that's where we really hit um, a problem. Um, the speaker that mentioned that most people on boards are over 35. Um, that may be part of the reason for that, but <laughs> we'll, I'll leave that one for now. Um, and I think the problem is as well that many people still really misunderstand what strategy is all about, even people that should know better. This was um, an article in American Banker magazine from only a week or so ago. And for several reasons, um, strategy often fails to deliver what people expect. And in this article, I think the author actually really illustrates that point very well. He suggests that strategy is fundamentally an exercise in forecasting and planning. Um, no wonder he thinks that strategy kills um, innovation. Um, added to that point, um, for many people, uh, I hear it time and time again, even from heads of strategy in multinational companies, 
they find that the strategy planning process and annual events is a, a, a often a waste of time, but it's still an exercise that they're forced to go through because they're expected to, and the documents get shelved within a week, and well, it, it, they may get looked at again at some point. So actually, what should be about strategy um, is actually usually nothing more than budgeting and resource allocation. And that's really not what strategy is all about. Um, I argue that strategic management is about working out how to survive and thrive in a world of transient advantage. And the cases we heard this morning, I mean, I think this is the, the challenge that they're trying to deal with. So I think at the moment, very, very few companies have mastered the uh, um, ways of dealing with transient advantage and actually don't recognize that doing so is in itself um, an advantage. So learning how to surf the waves is going to be the key. Um, I can't obviously in the space of time go through all of the tips in the book and I'm not going to read through the, the list that's here, I'll just leave this um, slide for a few minutes. And just, these are some of the rules uh, that I think um, are worth making note of. Um, a clear sense of uh, strategic direction. Uh, actually, having very few big um, objectives so that people really fully understand them um, is, is, is actually an important part of it. Continuously morphing, I'll just pick up one or two of these points. So Rita's argument is that uh, like strategic planning, um, innovation shouldn't be a, something that you do as an exercise occasionally. It should be a continuous um, process. And I'll hint at one of the items on there which is about having social architectures to deal with um, innovation and change. Uh, she's saying that the companies that get it right, um, their people actually spend a lot less time worrying about their roles and change than organisations that don't have a structure in place. Um, and actually, well, they hire the kind of people that thrive on, on change. Um, but the thing that actually anchors uh, and helps deal with the sort of paradox of stability and change at the same time the stability comes from the values and the culture, um, and the ch change is basically constantly being uh, triggered. And then the last point, rewards and incentives n need to be aligned. Uh, now this is a, how, how to actually bring about the constant change that we're talking about, and resource allocation within an organisation is really key. So again, it shouldn't be an annual exercise. Resources, uh, she recommends, should be actually uh, reassessed uh, continuously and decisions made at least on a quarterly basis. It's so you don't wait for the next year to decide where resources should be being shifted to. Um, it's a case of working out where they can be best optimized and do that fast. Uh, so one of the big differentiators between the firms that get it right or not is the way in which they actually deal with allocation of resources. Uh, related to that specific um, thing is basically you don't want fixed assets. Um, assets which were being used, um, especially physical assets I'm talking about, um, which were used to create the barriers to entry. Now, basically, they achieve exactly the opposite. They give you a big competitive disadvantage because it actually brings about what you, uh, well, at Rita and others call it inertia in the business. Uh, there's always a reason because you haven't actually uh, written off the cost of the assets to keep trying to make those assets work, even if you should be shifting to something else. Um, McKinsey put the comment in a slightly different way. I like the phrase, put your money where your strategy is, um, and actually use the money to bring about the change in the strategy. So uh, the argument is that strategies should move at the same pace as change, 
uh, the change in the business. Unfortunately, um, and this is what McKinsey found in only 2012, most companies don't do this, and that's big companies too. Um, I think I want to just give you one illustration of um, a company that kind of gets it right. Sorry. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. Um, so LVMH, um, they basically are mastering transient advantage to a degree and have been doing it for quite a long time. So they're not a technology company, and I wanted to deliberately not use a technology company just to give you some um, idea of difference. They structure the business in, uh, as almost two uh, businesses. On, so on one side, the culture is very open, freewheeling, very creative, and it's about um, letting people come up with ideas. But then, as soon as they've actually got a winning idea, um, the other side of the business is about actually uh, really transforming that, getting it to market, uh, making it work as fast as possible. And in that situation, uh, basically, there's no room for uh, creativity. It's, it's about discipline. The other point I'll just make quickly on this is that they deliberately invest in innovation, but they don't bet the business on one or two big things. They have a constant stream, and so uh, they're a pipeline, uh, but they actually manage the risk at the same time. Uh, this is part of the way in which you again deal with the uh, balance between uh, change and stability at the same time. Uh, so actually Rita made this point as well. The companies that get it right, they don't hire high-flying CEOs and keep changing the te management team. They actually promote from within because that retains the culture. Um, I think moving on to a slightly different subject, it's more important now to focus on value chains, uh, sorry, value networks and rather than value chains and understand the interdependencies within the network. So it's about relationships uh, within that. And I want to talk very briefly uh, in relation to that specifically. I think one thing we strategists even really don't talk enough about is the importance of communication and reporting, not just uh, annual, the annual reports. Um, boards frequently complain that they can't make the right decisions because they don't get the information they need. So if they don't, then how do actually investors get the information that they need? Um, that's the situation we're facing right now. Reporting is not seen as a possible strategic advantage. It's seen as compliance uh, and a burden. What it means is if the, if the information being communicated is bad, you get bad decisions by the board, investment opportunities get lost, the, the cost of capital is much higher. I talked to an investment uh, manager from ING Bank and basically, you know, the, the, they just factor in the, uh, the risk as extra costs. So many companies are paying too much for the financing that they get. Um, and also greater share price volatility if you don't actually signal and give information properly to shareholders. Um, and one point I want to make is that it's not necessarily about value that's being lost, it's about value sometimes that's not being added. And this is an interesting example. Warren Buffett, who doesn't normally invest in tech companies, um, actually delayed investing in IBM for five years, but when he did, he invested 10.7 uh, billion. So that gives you an indication of what the value of what might not be added um, can be by actually not reporting very well. In explaining why he made the decision to invest, um, he makes the point here about the importance of the clarity of communication. You need to tell the investor why they should be investing in very clear terms. Many companies are really bad at doing that. Um, right, I'm coming to the end and we can do some questions in a second. I just wanted to uh, briefly explain that 
Strategic Management Forum, we're a year old, and uh, what we're trying to do is promote uh, strategic management for the information age. Um, our purpose is about trying to advance the professional practice of strategic management. It's not, at the moment, a profession. And we believe that, actually, professionals, strategy uh, professionally practiced can transform the fortunes of businesses, organizations, and society. And that's really where we're coming from. Um, a quick plug there, actually, um, for the book as well. Um, so a free copy of the book if anybody wants to join the organization and learn more about strategic management. And my contact details there. I'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Paul. There's a lady uh, about six rows back. Oh, oh, nice. Hello. Um, hi, I'm particularly interested in examples. Uh, do you have any other examples than, say, Louis Vuitton, who you think are doing this well, even if it's not perfectly? So, yeah, I'm not sure. So, can you repeat the question? Please? Sorry. Do you have any other examples of companies other than Louis Vuitton who you think are doing this very well? Um, well, actually, I went to a very interesting presentation um, and Google's one of the other companies, it seems, uh, that really understand it. Um, some research I'm doing at the moment is actually into the importance of reputation. And I think that... <coughs> Everybody inside and outside uh, Google really understands uh, what their reputation is. And through that, it's very clear uh, what their strategy is. Um, so I, th I think um, they're a company that also are, are getting it right. Um, IBM would, uh, there are in, this, uh, in the technology space uh, probably a, a number of companies that are getting it right. They're not really well case studied at the moment, that I have to say. Somebody else here. Hi, yeah. Um my name is Bobby Hyam. I work for uh, one of these big companies that is probably struggling to adapt to change. And I, I like the ideas around, um, you know, realigning resources quickly so that you can react to changes in the market. But when you're in the business of selling, for example, enterprise software that typically has very long sales cycles, and you're selling to organisations that expect your, uh, they expect stability in your product roadmap, in the people that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, how do you then? go about realigning resources very quickly because that will not be what your customers are looking for. Well, I, I mean, in that case, you're, talk, you're talking about products which have got a long tail revenue stream as well. So you should continue funding uh, at the appropriate level, um, but at the same time be investing in whatever the next wave of revenue is going to be. So it's, it's not about switching everything from one thing to the other. Um, it's about adjusting where the resources get put. Um, so that you're fueling the next... I mean, this, uh, I talked to a strategist at Airbus, um, and they actually are dealing with this at the moment. They've got a fantastic order book for the products they've already got, but they're already working out that they've got an issue in terms of working out in 15 years' time where is the, where is the value that the clients want and where is the order going to come from. It's not the products that they've got now. I don't know if that answers the question. I, we can talk more about it afterwards anyway. There's a last question here. Um, it's quite fascinating. Can you hold the microphone? It's quite fascinating how different what you're talking about now is from sort of what we talked about in the, in the morning. Do you agree that a lot of the technologies that will become commonplace 10, 15 years from now will come from disruptive businesses who will probably follow very different strategies that even yeah. the big giants you are talking about are following at the moment, so it's an entirely different way of doing strategy. Um, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that I am seeing at the moment is that many of the new, really interesting business models are coming from the emerging economies, and very often they're coming from, well, some of them are high tech, some of them are actually low t quite low tech. Um, but those business models are often linked with social enterprise uh, models as well. And 
I actually argue is in a, I do a daily email strategy snack to provoke thought around strategy issues. I argued provocatively that um, I think uh, in, in future every business will need to be a social business because some of these big companies are becoming really big and so if a, tech, if a mobile phone company from India that's operating as a social enterprise came into the UK and gave some of our established operators a challenge, um, I think a lot of people would want to change because actually social enterprise is by its very nature a much more customer focused business um, and wouldn't we all want to switch to a customer focused technology provider? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, indeed. Well, thank you very much for that once again, Paul. Thanks. Cheers.